Tim Pat Coogan, we're talking about your book, The Famine Plot, England's Role in Ireland's Greatest Tragedy. Was the famine a plot by England and the UK? That question doesn't is really a, a bit, um, what they call a leading question, a blunt question in law. It's oversimplifies the issue. The, the famine occurred as a result of the circumstances the, in Ireland, the awful land system, the overcrowding, which had reduced some three million peasants to living in mud cabins, one room sleeping on the floor with men, women and children, maybe animals walking in and out. And uh, with the tiny amount of land that they were able to afford, only able to grow one crop of which they depended, mm. the potato. And when the blight struck, uh, there, there were two ways to go. One was to alleviate famine, and the other was to, behind the cloak of famine relief, and using the word relief, mm. and invading a whole, using a whole lot of uh, manoeuvres, including invading against the life, the style of the Irish and their laziness and excessive procreation. Yeah. And even the fact that they used what, lazy beds to grow their potatoes right. was taken as an example of their fecklessness. And this was all the work of divine providence uh, to, get, to put down, uh, punish the people for things like Catholic emancipation and the Manuk grant yeah. and so on. Now, the first method of trying to alleviate the famine was the one chosen by the minister in charge, Prime Minister Peel, mm. Uh, when the famine, when the first blight occurred in '45, which wasn't the most grievous one, but he, sorry, uh, he tried to uh, alleviate the famine by surreptitiously smuggling grain into the country. It had mm. to be surreptitious because of the grain laws, mm. the corn laws, right, uh, which had tariffs on incoming grain. The yeah. squirearchy in England wanted uh, to keep the price up. You see, yeah. Now, for England's own best interest, it was important to get them down because they now had a huge proletariat beginning to grow in the new cities of Victorian England and workers who wanted cheap food. Then the famine hits, or the blight hits. And he brought it in, in collusion with the Bering brothers, the famous banking brothers, who uh, worked for a very small fee. They tried to help too. Right. He didn't like the Irish particularly. He'd been over here in Dublin Castle, chief secretary or something. But he... Um, so Peel made some attempts. But he, he made every attempt. Yeah. And he then he launched, went to war with the Corn Laws right. to break them. He said, you can't be feeding... You can't have it in one part of the United Kingdom. We were part of the United Kingdom. The trouble, yes. of course, was we had no government. Yeah. The out, outcome of conquest of centuries, every decision had to be made in England. The, I mean, with all the pomp and flummery of Dublin Castle, they're only, flummery, they're only yeah. flunkies. The big... Uh, the big decisions were made in England. Yeah. They administrated Ireland, but the troops and all that were, the rule of Ireland was, was done from Whitehall, from London. And um, anyway, he made this Homeric uh, battle and got the corn laws changed, but it was spread over a three year period, so it didn't really help during the famine. Uh, and they got him, the squirearchy and the rest, and the forces allied against him on a spurious issue, an Irish coercion bill actually. In the night that the Corn Laws passed, they had a parliamentary ambush and led by Disraeli. And uh, people who never voted in Rent About Ireland turned up and voted against uh, whatever he wanted. Yeah. He didn't have to give over, he'd had such agony over the Corn Laws, and he was so tired and fed up that he resigned. And that let in the Whigs, mm. the Liberals. And it also let in, uh, disastrously for Ireland, Charles Trevelyan, the Secretary of the Treasury, yeah. in effect the head of the British Civil Servant, very popular, powerful man. He'd been at odds, blackout with Peel for three years. Now talking 1846. Mm. In 1843, he had visited Ireland and he was the embodiment of the anti-Celt, anti-Catholicism, disdainful Bible reading, uh, aristocratic Protestant. Uh, he didn't like, uh, he came back and he gave them a lurid account in the office of Peel of what he'd seen, man to man, confidential talking mm. to the um, Prime Minister and to whoever the Treasury Minister was at the time, Mr. Rick Boss. 
And then he walked out of the office and he wrote, allegedly an anonymous article, but everybody know who wrote it. I've just come back from Ireland after six weeks, you know. Yeah. It's two part lengthy article. Uh -huh. And it's reeked with anti-Irish sentiment, anti-Catholicism, anti-Celticism. Yeah. Immediate and terrible war, was rebellion was being fomented. Collins was, uh, O'Connell didn't know what the hell he was doing and he was, was this, he knew very well he wouldn't get repealed. And yeah. He was really in the grip of the priests. Uh, he was, you know, driving a stagecoach full tilt. But suddenly the reins had been taken by a man in black sitting beside him, a priest, you know. Yes. This kind of stuff. So Peel was horrified at this breach. He said the man must be a complete fool to do a thing like that, or else whatever he is. But they, they didn't get on. Mm. So from for three years over Ireland, there was hostility between Trevelyan and the Prime Minister. He was so powerful he didn't fire him, though, okay. or couldn't fire him. Now, if you read the... I, I, actually, I don't know why other historians have never done it, but I'm the first one to reproduce the letter. And it really is appalling. It could be written by Goebbels. This is Trevelyan's letter. Trevelyan's letter. No. Basically his account of what he felt. What he did, yeah, but yeah. his attitudes of yeah. account. Now, in 1846, this man sits in his office and in comes the Whigs, and he and the incoming Chancellor, Sir Charles Wood, get on like a house in fire. They have the very same attitudes. Hmm. And Trevelyan, in turn, became the czar of Irish relief. He was the theoretician. Mm. And the Whigs, of course, were devoted to the political economy theories of the day. There was a thing called the London Political Club. and You've heard of Adam Smith and free trade and uh -huh. the belief that if men are unemployed, it's largely their own fault. And if they're yeah. poor, you know, it's their own fault. And the state is no uh, call. They have no call on the state, etc. If the parents won't do it, nobody else is anywhere. It's up to them. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, they also had a uh, belief in the virtues of hard work and admirable things, and this providence, providentialism thing that it was with a god, you know, and punishing them, mm. punishing the Irish for their many fold sins, popery, etc. After the Corn Laws debate, party discipline was shattered, and while the new Prime Minister John Russell was probably um, sympathetic enough to Ireland in some ways. Uh, he was a Whig, believed in all these doctrines, and he couldn't really control them because there was a coterie of very powerful. This is the second point now that I make that I don't know why other historians have not made. The second point was that you've heard of Lord Palmerston, haven't you? Yeah. Lord Palmerston, Lord Lansdowne, Lord Cran Rickard, and Lord Monteagle, for example. Mm -hmm. They were all extremely large Irish landlords as well. Yeah. And they were not, they were very much in favour of clearing the land of the surplus peasantry. Mm -hmm. Monteagle is more humanitarian than the others, and he raised this thing, he was protesting about the, the unfortunate peasantry and um, how are they going to live. And Palmerston said to him uh, at the cabinet table, Look, we all know that. The the solution to Ireland there's too many people in the land they have to be cut off it. and it is recorded that there was quote a shudder and they turned back to other business now the other business could have included anything for an empire for example they might even be talking about what else they did at the time to give me an example of their general attitude to the world the opium wars in China they forced the Chinese against their will to accept the opium trade because English merchants are making a fortune out of it. Mm. They invented a special warship for the purpose, a thing that could fire uh, very heavy weaponry and was powered by either sail or by engines deep in the bowels of huge engines. So they blew up the great rivers and they blew the Chinese junks out of the way. They, you know, they'd have muskets and sails. Yeah. Whereas this awful thing, it was like the atomic bomb of its day, a maritime atomic bomb. Palmerston was the archetypal gunboat diplomacy man. Right. And they got Hong Kong that way. That was the, That's how Hong Kong went in British hands. So those gentlemen were not particularly soft-hearted. Yeah. And they had an Irish incentive also to get their land in order to grow cattle. Okay. These tiny rents and jumble of leases, crazy. So they are possibly looking for Irish land to develop their own agricultural and business They weren't needs. possibly looking for it. They, they owned the Irish land. Right. They said, of, for example, Lansdowne would have had about 100,000 acres. 
Hmm. And the system of welfare, such as it was in Ireland, was workhouses. And the country was divided up into unions, so many adjoining estates and areas. And there was a workhouse in each one. But the trouble was, there were, the workhouses were fewest, and the landlords were brokest in the areas where they most needed them, west mm -hmm. of the Shannon, from Dingle up to Donegal. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the terrible deaths. Mm -hmm. Mayo was the worst, Galway, Sligo, Kerry, mm. Cork, they were the worst areas. And uh, as famine broke out, all these Whig theories came into conflict with uh, doling out free food. Mm. And the repuls the, um, the workhouses had to have what Tavernian called a repulsive element in them mm. to prevent slaggers coming in, mm -hmm. getting free food and not working. You couldn't be encouraging on uh, you know, idleness. And they separated women from men, families were broken up, children were broken up. And of course, as the famine proceeded, they became centres of disease spreading. Mm. And uh, I came across terrible accounts of the deaths. I mean, really horrifying accounts of, of how children in particular were left. Yeah. The parents dumped them and went. Mm -hmm. And there were tragic partings with the parents, you know. Is it true also that some women were basically shipped off to Australia to, to, to marry wealthy men? Oh, that family? happened. Uh, there they, they were, they was um, a, a group of young women sent off, but it didn't work. There were only 15, 16 year olds who'd been yeah. heard in these conditions, so nobody went out with them. Uh, there weren't wealthy men, there were any men. You see, <laughs> right. the, the, the scum of the earth was transported to Australia. And I mean, they'd be met by ravening criminals looking for wives or looking for women. So get them out. They did. The like Kenwood that. girls, I think they called them. It, 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 it was an experiment that didn't work. It was pretty awful. Mm. What they did do, by way, as the famine wore on to clear their land, they shipped people out. They turned their land over to them. They mm. shipped them over. For example, did you see the film, The Gangs in New York? Yeah. Well, did you remember the five points? The yeah. terrible five points. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where most of Lord... Or Lord Lansdowne tenants fetched yes. up in. He had, um, excuse me, like bloody glasses. Right. And an agent called Trench, who was notoriously efficient. This is the guy of the five points. Uh, when he, yeah. he was his agent in, in yeah. Kerry, but he convinced him that instead of supporting paupers in the union, it would be cheaper for him to pay their passage out, one off expenditure, and they were gone. Now they're they're said to have arrived in every stage of undress and distress. The most shabby immigrants landed in, in America, according to the papers at the time. And Trench was so efficient, efficient in that, that uh, a priest is, has preached a sermon, or quoted as preaching a sermon, that, quote, one trench could drain all Ireland. Uh, Palmerston sent them off in vile conditions. They... Um, Landed naked in some cases in mm. the snows of Canada. Clan Rickard the same. And Mount Eagle was more humane. <laughs> He'd be a spring rice and it was a descendant mm. of his who was sailed in the guns along with the um, mm. Erskine Childers on the Asgard for 1916. Right. They had a bit of nationalism in. But while the, the, um, the, they did at times run very efficient schemes, for example, after the leadership given by the um, Quakers, they set up soup kitchens, which worked very well, yeah. and they claimed to have fed the three million. But it's then they reversed that on the grounds of expense, Trevanya didn't like that, and they made, um, conforming to the workhouse philosophy and the Whig philosophy that you had to work they uh, made relief contingent on outdoor outdoor works, mm. like road works, 10 pence a day or something. And sometimes those roads were uh, four or five feet under snow, mm -hmm. so they couldn't be worked on. So people were standing around waiting for the work to begin and dying of starvation. People who weren't strong enough to work and dying mm. of starvation. And uh, above all, the workhouse. And I don't know, it's hard to explain why I can't. At one stage, they changed the workhouse rules so that only, only able-bodied members of families could be admitted. 
the weak ones. everybody was left on the scrap. Yeah, the weak, they were left yeah. outside. I mean, yeah. the people who should have been sheltered, the stronger people yeah. would have survived. And even then, the workhouses, you, you've likened them to concentration camps in many ways. Oh, concent- it? it's nearly a libel of concentration camps. Yeah. To this day, if you go down, imagine, you just go down to um, Skibbereen, uh, well, obviously, the confines of the, the, the dimensions. I've visited a few workhouses and I've visited some concentration camps. And it's the same architectural aim to make you feel enclosed and inferior. He who enters here, leave hope behind, kind of thing. You yeah. Know? Um, but forget that. Uh, the amount of space available to each person is portrayed in Skibbereen very simply and very effectively. There's a tile, 22 inches square, and that was the amount each person had in, in a workhouse. Men, women and children, and they were ravaged sure. by fevers, yeah. famine fevers. The children in particular died in awful conditions. Uh, I mean, the descriptions of that really moved me. Shocking, yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, no excuse of economics or anything uh, could have spared it. Now, one other point to make about it, mm. about overall responsibility. Mm-hmm. When the potato blight burst, O'Connell and other leaders of the society knew very well what this entailed. And they visited the Lord Lieutenant or the Chief Secretary, whoever he was, Lord Hatesbury. This was even under Peel. And at the outset, what they wanted was what would have alleviated the famine too. It's what's alleviated, of course, not, not completely solaced. Mm. But it was, it, what they proposed is what is done today by NGOs all over the world in a famine situation. Mm-hmm. Close the ports to exports of food. Mm distribute the food locally, ban distilling. Mm-hmm. That's a very important thing. The amount of corn went into that. Yes. They wanted levies and loans raised on the strength of the Irish forests and all the kind of relief schemes you can imagine put into operation. Mm. Wasn't done. And we exported food all through the famine. Yeah. And it, one of the things I take issue with the Irish academics, the, particularly the UCD school, they... They would argue, some of them even today. Uh, well, I mean, even if they had done all that, that wouldn't have made up the loss of the potato. The inflammatory nature, too, of uh, taking, which is on record as having happened, cartloads of food down to the docks through roads, hmm. uh, lined by ditches in which people were dying of starvation and of fevers and of um, terrible bowel complaints from eating nettles and things. Hmm. I mean, if you even took one sandwich out in those conditions of being plumbed, you would take cartloads of eggs and butter and meat. Yeah. Terrible, you know. Shocking. Mm. And, and what Guarded by Irish troops, Irish soldiers, of course. Yeah. Must do it. It's our duty. You know? Why has that been the attitude of Irish historians and, and academics well, over the years? different they, people give different... Sort of deny it almost. I yes, think. almost deny it. Different yeah. people give different uh, um, reasons. Um one would be uh, that they're taught in English universities aware. Yeah. Professor Joe Lee says that, I quote him, uh, that uh, they'd be afraid that um, they could be accused of Celtic exuberance if they started, <laughs> you know, if they started justifying our claims. Yeah. Uh, there was, th- what he was doing there now, for example, because he gives you an example of it, probably a fellow was taught by them. Apparently there was a review of a programme I did Pat Kenny, mm. and he, he said what a lively and entertaining and provocative uh, uh, interview it was, and uh, congratulated me on the use of, uh, use of the Von Mo and that kind of thing, but said it was historically doubtful. But how would he know it's historically doubtful or not? He hadn't read the book. He just right. thought, and he didn't see my sources. <laughs> he wouldn't have read the Trevelyan letter. Yes. You know, yeah. he wouldn't have realised that Palmerston and the others were sitting at the table with all these Irish estates. Yeah. And they talked about 100,000 acres each. Can you imagine the tenantry they had? Yeah, yeah. So there's a denial then among them. Still a just, denial amongst yeah. them. But that's what he said. Now, the, the, the dichotomy exists not merely between... Well, I think, yes, largely the UCD historians, up to recently, they were the ones who, who did do the writing. Yeah. Uh, now, the Cork people, you couldn't accuse them of that. They won a wonderful, produced a wonderful book there from the geography department called Famine Atlas. Yes. Now, Famine Atlas should have been produced back in the year 1945, which was the centenary of the famine. Yeah. And in that year, prior to it, in fact, de Valera, 
approached a couple of UCD historians, well, one in particular, Dudley Edwards, yeah, uh, Robert Dudley Edwards, uh, to produce a centenary commemorative volume. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, who was uh, a Whig historian, Butterfield was his, the Whig historian Butterfield was his uh, kind of lodestar. Uh, he was also an expert in the Tudors. Right. Now, what Henry VIII and Elizabeth, his, the daughter, and what they wrecked in Ireland or wreaked in Ireland would do for you by way of guidance for the Irish famine should be approached, you know, I don't yeah. know. But anyway, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the ideal background for it, to put it yeah. mildly. And he had a, a sidekick, Desmond Williams, the boat professor of history in UCD, both Peterhouse men, you know, both Cambridge, like them all, and um, they fluted about with that thing yeah. for years, and they didn't really produce it at all. Yeah. At the end, uh, the book appeared 13 years after the Devil Air approach. It, it consisted of seven large chapters, and they're quite good. One of them in particular, uh, Roger McHugh's one about what people lived on or ate during the famine, which is derived from the uh, folklore archives in, UC in UCD. They only yeah. had to walk down the street and get this stuff, but they didn't. But it was really produced by one of the contributors, a man called Kevin B. Nolan, who's still alive and whom I interviewed. And Kevin told me about going around badgering contributors and getting chapters up on uh, shelves and things mm. and finally put the thing together. And to the very end, they were so careless of their duty as editors that he actually wrote the, the the introduction by the editors. It's signed with their initials. They didn't write it at all. He did, and mm. he put their initials on it. Yeah. And how could things like that happen? I mean, for the seventy-five or eighty years, whatever it is, um, off the foundation of the say of the Republic of Ireland in the southern in the south. Well, they were uh, very really powerful men. And, yeah. We had uh, a Republican in quote unquote. Oh Republican well, it's very, well. I mean, how could a thing like what happened yeah. to that Indian woman down in Galway happen? Yes. I mean, it's, it's the slithery nature of Irish politics. They wait for the courts to solve the decision. You know, like it was the courts introduced contraception here, not the legislatures. It was just the McGee decision, as it was called in, in the High Court, uh, validated by the Supreme Court, uh, which allowed the importation of uh, contraceptions for this woman, McGee. Mm. Uh, and uh, did she? I think she might have had to go to Europe as well. But anyway, that kind of thing. And they, they, they faced up to the S X case and then they backed away from actually implementing, hoping it would go away. Yeah. And I mean, apart from the agony that woman died in and the trauma they've occasioned her husband and the damage they've done to the Indian community, they, have, they seem to have no idea of the effect uh, of, on the world's media. Mm -hmm. I sat in here in that room uh, on, the, uh, on nights after it, night after night, and I found that that was the lead story on CNN, Al Jazeera, Sky, BBC, Channel 4, showing the Irish as poltroons and in the grip of a discredited church that they'd allowed things like that to happen. Mm. And that's our politicians' view. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were even more hidebound and churchbound. One of the things that happened during the famine, and mind you, this is a distinct relevance to today, is that the habit born out of the two forms of colonialism, Mother England and Mother Church, and the cap touching and the deference, we have a very strong tendency to, to learned helplessness. Mm. She can do nothing about it. Yeah. And if I said to you, and don't crown as authority, and we had censorship as well, official censorship, that means censorship of the mind, that you can't, uh, you know, you don't think for yourself. Yeah. And this, this certainly... This is one of the quarrels that the Protestants had in the, 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 the uh, Protestant-controlled educational system at the time of the famine tried to teach Bible reading so that people could read the thing for themselves and develop habits of independent thought, whereas the bishops were against that. Mm. Then the, the Protestants discredited themselves by the effort of some of the supers to get people to change their minds, yeah. their religion rather. That's right, they would get assistance from They'd the They'd get food, and they get, get houses sometimes. Yes, you know? yeah. I mean, it's a damnable thing to do. But of course, yeah. Catholic missionaries and evangelicals, you never hear the word evangelical or proselytizing used about the missions. Mm. It's missionaries. Yes. What are they trying to do? Yeah. Change the religion to people. But mind you, I've been through Africa, and you would not hear a bad word about the Irish missionaries. Don't mind what anyone tells you. 
the African educational system today is laid down by Irish missionaries and often laid down at the cost of their lives, mm. not the conditions they lived in. And uh, they left a good deposit there. And part of the NGO tradition we still have, we always have that missionary tradition going out through Europe, the old medieval monks. Yeah. But the famine heightened that. But unfortunately, that learned helplessness thing, which is still with us, meant they didn't rise up. They didn't have habits of independent thought to answer your question about the famine. Mm. Uh, the level of education was such, I mean, there would have been three or 4,000 people going to college then, 8,000 in the whole country. I remember when I left school in 54, there was a paragraph in the Independent on page one saying that we had uh, 3,000 boys and girls sitting down today to do their leaving cert. Well, I would imagine today there'd be, what, 40,000 doing Something it, you know, like that, yeah. and going on, most of them for yeah. a third level. So a different climate. But the learned helplessness is still there. And, for example, if I were to say to you, possibly not you, but to most people, mm. it's a disgrace. Look at the suicides. Look at people's savings wiped out. Look at pensioners who were told to put their money into bank shares. Look at the way they're living now. Look at people in terror losing their jobs. Look at emigration starting again. Look at unemployment and nobody going to jail. And the immediate answer you get is no, and they won't either. Mm. Because in Ireland, they don't expect you can, that they do that or they won't. Mm. They announced several years after the crash, they announced this week only, you can check into the news, that white collar crime has gone up and that the reason is that the um, fraud squad have no backup they need solicitors, they need barristers, they need forensic accountants, mm -hmm. and they can't be appointed mm -hmm. because of the public service embargo. Okay. So the catch-22, the people who caused this terrible crash and created the public service embargo are going scot-free yeah. because of the public service embargo. And the bloody government, which is allowing people to go away with half a million pound pensions, allowing huge amount of money to be paid for discredited bankers to work in banks, allowing civil servants to go scot-free in the Department of Finance, who should have been watching what was happening, allowing the central bankers to go free, yeah. allowing um, <clears throat> all the directors of the banks and many other companies, allowing things to go like those bed and breakfast loans. Yeah. And do you see... A, a, and all, all those, those people are just... Don't disturb the cosy club of the dog. Right. Okay. Uh, but all they have to do is put in a handful of, of solicitors and barristers and accountants into them the chief apparatus of the state, yeah. you know, cab and all that, uh, not merely criminal assets you want, it's to go backwards uh, yeah. and see what happened. And uh, the police are excellent. Don't even tell you they're not. They could they could get the evidence, but they can't carry the war yeah. in the courts. And, and do you see this as somewhat connected to what that's learned? Yeah, I do, yes. And we, yeah, we, we people have should challenge learned. that. Yeah. They should demand it. Yeah. Now, I'm very glad that as we're speaking, the trade unions have at last brought people out in the streets today. Okay. I don't know how it'll go, but I mean, it's it's monstrous that the, the decent people of Ireland are suffering all these agonies. And it is agony. I don't accept the word austerity. It's hardship is the word we should use. Mm. I mean, there's hunger back in Ireland. We've lost our government. Mm. We've lost our sovereignty. The government is still there, but we're in the begging bowl position, standing in a door queue in Brussels with the IMF and the Centre, yeah. what you call them, all these, these, these institutes, the Troika. The Troika. Yeah. And uh, people say, ah, so what can you do? What can you do? And, 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 so you, and I'm sorry, and all yeah. this is taking place on the eve of one of the worst budgets in the history of Ireland. Yeah. We're promised more taxes, it's property tax. People who are already scourged yeah. to take more wounds. The good, the decent, and the people who caused all this is it walking around free without let or hindrance and no sanction. That's where let and hindrance. That's that's the legacy of the famine. Again, that's the which is the legacy. That that that, yeah. that, that circumstance is yeah. a leg, a legacy of the famine. Now th this uh, the evil walking around free and the good paying for them. Yeah. Okay. Now the, there was a belief, uh, based on what you were saying, a belief, probably even more than a belief, that among the British establishment, that this famine was good for us in some sh certain way. It was God's lesson or something like that. Is there, that was providentialism. Yeah. That was is, widespread. Is Is there any evidence that they applied the same belief to their own people back in England? Oh, well, I mean, the difference between the clearances in the Highlands and Ireland. I mean, sure they cleared them, they shipped them out, but. Yeah. Uh, 
they went in well-founded ships, and at least they were fed and they were yeah. dressed properly and able to withstand the cold. I mean, I stood in a dock on the Clyde up from Dumbarton uh, one day with an Irish. Uh, well, his father and mother were from Mayo, but he, he's a very well-respected journalist in the area, and uh, he showed me the on that side. Without my hand there, mm. I would touch the dock, touch the ground if I wished, where the sailing ships left for Nova Scotia, New Scotland, mm. those places to take the Highlanders who have been cleared, who are not mostly Catholics too. And where I was standing, and down to my left, was where the Irish emigrants came aboard from the packet from, uh, came ashore, I mean, from the packet from Belfast, yeah. and landed and died there from typhus two yeah. weeks to go on. And was, was this treatment ultimately meted out to the Irish because we were resistant to British rule? Yes, and, and they had this belief that uh, some of them now, not all of them, because after all, a lot of them, Peel didn't do that. Yeah. But I mean, you can't say that all the Conservatives were kindly, because Disraeli, for example, who succeeded him was anything but. Yeah. And, and I've quoted what he had to say about the Irish, and it's appalling. But by and large, until the churches got out and, and until... Uh, the Whigs, Trevelyan and Palmerston, particularly, um, particularly Woods and, and Trevelyan, got the PR machine going. The Irish, they, they were sympathetic to them. Mm. But then you get Woods making statements like, never was a nation so generous to an ungrateful nation, you know, this was one that has gone around the world trumpeting their rebelliousness and their ingratitude and, yeah. and uh, looking for more money, like trying to keep children alive. This was her. Yeah, gratitude, and above all, what they had on their side was the Lon the Times. Uh -huh. They got control of the Times. Really, they, t the famous editor uh, Delan, at the time, uh, uttered a uh, um, proverb, if you like, a, a saying anyway that was the rule of newspapers ever after: mm -hmm. the press lives by disclosures. So. The powers that be saw that he got plenty of disclosures, plenty of news about everything. And in return, now you'd have to class yourself back into those days when the Times was, the, this would be the equivalent of um, um, Sky, BBC, Channel mm. 4, Telegraph. And probably Time. even more powerful because that's all there more, was. More, that's media. right, yeah. it, it was, it yeah. was. And it was taken abroad as the voice of England. So it right. was absolutely the way it was. It was sacred writ. And they published editorials like, we welcome the famine, uh, when the Irishman really? learns to get rid of... Yeah, I mean, I've quoted them. When when the Irishman learns to... Uh, uh, ceases to be potato fadgy, in other words, potato eating, mm. and adopts meat, becomes... Um, what do you call a meat eater? Mm -hmm. Carnivore. It's, carnivore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this is going to be habits of... Uh, yeah. Eating meat's going to bring habits. So they were, they were doing it for all for our own good. <laughs> you, know, to, you were going to become more moral if you ate meat. It was going to yeah. make you more uh, mm. reliable, and more industrious. You wouldn't yeah. be lazy. And yeah. You'd so see the virtues of hard work. Most of this has either been airbrushed or totally ignored yeah. in Irish history. Yeah. Or, and, and you still got that fellow with the Times that, that your man rang me up to talk about saying that it was historically doubtful. Yes. Without having read the book. Yes, of course, you absolutely. Uh, but the... Uh, the um, the editorial, I, I like that, I hesitate to use the word like, but the one I would commend to you is uh, uh, symbolising the attitude of the Times. Uh, and it was probably written, because they actually wrote some of these editorials, uh, Trevelyan and, and Woods. Could have been written by Trevelyan, I can't really swear to that. But in view of these letter, phraseology is very similar. Um, he says, the, the, the London Times said this, the Times, and this is an exact quote, I've memorised it. We look forward to the day when a Celt on the banks of the Shannon will be as rare as the Red Man on the banks of the Hudson. Mm -hmm. and they, he, you know, famine raved. They, they pointed to the, the outburst of generosity from the ordinary public at the start. and from I mean, some of the English worked really diligently in mm -hmm. famine relief committees and gave... Big people like Rothschild and these fellows worked and, and gave their offices over to it. Right. But actually, Trevally didn't like that. He only gave £25 to that yeah. outburst initially and uh, 
Woods gave two fifty, and by the time the famine was finished, they had those, they had those that yeah. relief effort paired way back. Yeah, so were Palm, were Palmerston and Trevelyan and guys like this were on a, a mission themselves. Yeah. To they were using the famine to, yeah. uh, and again, I've given it's not my opinion now. Yes, this is not historically doubtful. I have quoted. Um, Woods and Trevelyan saying things like uh, to people who would object, like I think it was uh, Monteagle who wrote Trevelyan. He knew where the power lay, pointing out that evils are about to befall the peasantry in one particularly bad weather, bad winter. Could have been forty seven or forty eight. Mm. Remember this bloody thing went on from forty five to the deaths really sat, set in. Nobody died under Peel from mm-hmm. starvation, but from forty six to fifty one, my God, they did. Mm-hmm. And to show you the duplicity of uh, the lies, in '48, Trevelyan published a book, The Irish Crisis, showing his great efforts and what he had done, and claiming the famine was over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Terrible death yeah, still to yeah. occur, in so, awful conditions. So, so, but anyway, just, just to finish yeah. out, to give you an example of what they were glossing over and what they were saying, when people, we say it was Monty, it could have been anybody, um, complained. There's a letter there in which he says, you can't, uh, you know, it's not bad, really. I mean, things are going well enough. We're getting rid of the middlemen. The middlemen were the people who took the big chunks of land from the landlords and rented it out at ever-increasing rents in small lots to these peasants who were living on them and growing the potatoes. Yeah. So to get rid of them. But <laughs> your man wasn't writing about middlemen or economics. He was writing about the need to save the starving. Yeah. And yeah. this is what your man thought was the silver lining in the cloud. Yeah. And he talked about that silver lining and a divine providence is doing this and a divine providence is doing that. And he had a phrase which um, uh, both he and Woods used, or that Woods used, Woods seemed to use everything he said. Yeah. He said... Um, the situation will only be remedied by natural causes or natural events. I forget which you use, natural events, natural causes. Anyway, natural events are, if you evict a woman in her 60s, barefooted, with no rain gear, the granny, say, and her children, and her, you know, her, her, yeah. her daughter and her husband, also no rain gear and barefooted, and their children, in the middle of a January sleet storm, yeah. natural events will take natural care of the problem yeah. fairly quickly. And you use that kind of emollient language. He Woods refused in very bitter editorial he got, and very uh, in in the Times to justify. Mm. Uh, we talk about the ingratitude of the Irish to justify his refusing a particular loan of fifty thousand or a hundred thousand, two fifty. Mm. I think it was fifty for children alone. Yeah, I wouldn't even do that. Mm-hmm. Trevelyan stopped uh, another thing during the winter. Mm-hmm. Uh, surplus army clothing. Yeah, it's gone old or was surplus to requirement. Uh, he wouldn't allow that to be distributed in Ireland yeah. to the to the people to yeah. cover the nakedness. So, so effect, effectively, e- even today, would you say we have let the British off the hook in relation to the responsibility or over the family? We have, yes, and, and I we think had Tony Blair's comment. Tony Blair now deserves more credit over Ireland okay. than any other English Prime Minister. I know from my knowledge, as they say, of my knowledge, you know, I've written this book about the IRA, which is yes. regarded as the uh, standard work and I have my context and I can tell you that Tony Blair is still highly regarded by the former IRA leadership that he was the man who made peace possible and it began with his apology for the famine. Mm. He did understand the debt owed to the Irish for what happened then. The Donegal childhood, the granny up there, Protestant lady Mm. whom he spent the holidays with, he imbibed more than the Guinness he began to drink up there uh, he got this fireside tales about the famine and he, he was right and it struck a nerve and you could trace the beginning of the peace process from that speech I mean there were back channels there, were, there was all sorts but that was evidence of good faith yeah. and evidence of a new mindset and it, it worked mm. and uh, an irony by the way you may remember or you may know that the IRA blew up uh, Lord Mountbatten yes after that was a terrible deed and that was a shocking thing the child had blown up an old lady and local boy who was working on the boat but uh, anyway they did it and then they issued this statement after it giving their reasons one of which was the famine now ironically the castle that that party had set out from that morning Mountbatten and the rest that holiday party 
that castle was once Parmesan's. That was his estate. Uh -huh. It just shows you that the way, yeah. the way some people think historically, and yeah. how how people who would do that, knowing of course yeah. that the castle was was Parmesan's once, yeah. uh, they would be affected by Blair's. Yeah. speech you know and and where if you can answer this i'm not really sure if it can be answered where do we go from here in terms of irish people uh dealing with the famine and holding the british and other people responsible for the famine well i think that what we should do is behave uh, with dignity and without rancor to see that the lessons are learned that we have justice in this country to begin with uh, for everybody, and that we just don't go on blandly uh, using smokescreen or PR to avoid putting the people responsible in the dock. Mm. There should be people in jail, just as Enron executives in, in America went to jail for what mm. they did. Uh, we should have enough strength of character to do that and regard the entitlements of the poorest of the poor who are out of jobs now mm. as, as important as the former chairman of a bank. Mm -hmm. and it should be subject to the same law mm -hmm. the little man in the dole hasn't done anything wrong the yeah. other fellow has yeah. that's one thing the second thing we should continue, continue uh, our efforts for the third world we should be very that should be uh, we should be careful uh, about aid I mean John O'Shea had many faults but one thing he hadn't was he wasn't stupid and uh, he did a lot setting up that goal organization should be remembered to him which again is based on the missionary tradition and mm. the famine and he said uh, all along he was saying it publicly we shouldn't be giving aid to uganda that they were um corrupt and they were had enough money apparently to wage wars in, in neighboring countries to get out the diamonds so why were we giving them money mm. and now it proves that the millions went down the tubes there we should stop that because Apart from that being wrong in itself when we can't afford it, it also makes people leery about continuing with foreign aid. Yeah. Well, we should continue. We have an obligation, as given what happened, to continue being yeah. good. Sorry. I don't get asked out to dinner, but I get asked out to the demos. Yeah. <laughs> good, good stuff. Mm. And, yeah, so you're saying the, the um, putting people to jail over recent financial scandals, continuing aid, is there anything else we should do as well? Try to be as humane and as decent a country as possible. Treasure our sovereignty. Yes. Treasure our sovereignty. I cannot say that enough, loud enough. What I'm talking about would probably have happened to a degree, given the detritus of conquest, given the overpopulation of the land. Mm. But instead of a humane system of emigration being devised, and instead of industry being developed, mm. your part of the famine was caused by the fact there was no roads. You couldn't distribute food in places like Mayo. Mm. There was only one... Uh, one workhouse for Connemara, like in Clifton, is went bankrupt. It was two hundred thousand acres. Right. One there was one estate there. Yeah. Humanity Dick Martin, the man, the jewellist who founded the Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, went bankrupt. Had to be sold. Yeah. And the, one of the most devastating comments about the famine is there's a note in the prospectus of the auctioneers assuring would be buyers that it actually the estate is modern Connemara that's yeah. what it was it was that big 200,000 acres uh, and they're assuring uh, prospective buyers that the people named in the 1841 census as living on the estate were no longer there yeah now that means uh, ethnically cleansing yes face and it it was ethnically cleansing 200,000 acres given the subdivision of land given the size of families represents at least 200,000 people, if yes. not more. Gone, yes. like chaff. And, and for, for those crimes of ethnic... Crimes, oh yeah, I may say I, flatly in the book... Yeah, how do uh, we hold the British responsible for well, that? Well, I... What well, you can do... You, I'll tell you one of the things that's happening, um, and I'm supporting it, but I just want to go back to the question of sovereignty. Yeah. That happened because we had no government. We were appealing for the crumbs for the rich, from the rich man's table in Whitehall. And unfortunately, the man sitting at the head of the table was Charles Trevelyan. And yeah. the man sitting at the other end of the table was Charles Wood. Mm -hmm. And now it's a different table in a different city. It's in Brussels. And sitting at it are the European Central Bank, the IMF, and uh, the other member of the Troika, uh, the, another bank. Yes. And... We're completely at their mercy and they're dictating these cuts 
we need the money, we have to take it, we're very glad to get it. It was our own fault in many ways. Laxity, not, not, uh, we had a drunken prime minister and a dying finance minister. Uh, what Bertie Ahern was doing as, as finance minister in his time, when all this was building up and then his T-shirt, I don't know, but I'd like to hear it at a tribunal or something. I'd like to hear him give an account to the doll of what he thought he was doing. I mean, what I remember him saying was that he'd wonder about people who were criticising the Celtic Tiger and worrying that a bubble would burst. He was mm. said, his, his famous comment was, yeah. you'd wonder about people who are that miserable that they wouldn't go and commit suicide. Yeah. But by God, a lot of people are committing suicide now. Sounds I can good. tell you that in Glasnevin and in the local undertakers, they've told me that suicide rates in this country are up by 50%. So I'd hold the Irish to account before I'd start holding the British to account. But I think it's important for them to understand our susceptibilities and why there is um, mistrust of England. I mean, the crown is... And yet it shows you there's still an affection for England because the crown is the symbol of oppression. And yet look at how popular the Queen is and the mm. royal family are. And absent the North, there's no reason for us not to be friendly. You can see how friendly they are to us, to our soccer players, yeah. to you know, to our athletes. Uh, the British are very popular on BBC, Irish I mean, on BBC, etc. Uh, we've always had our friends over there. But I think for rational discourse, there's an exercise which I would commend to you as being uh, the template of what our attitude should be. Being conducted, needless to say, not in Dublin, not in UCD, but in an American university in Fordham, New York, next April. When there's a tribunal being set up with academics on both sides of the argument, prosecuting England and defending England, mm. and these are objective historians versed in the famine, and I think that's the way to go about it. And I am delighted; I've been honoured uh, to be uh, made a patron of that, mm. along with well-known fellow terrorists like Brian uh, Freel. Right. And Robbie, Robert Balla, our, right. leading, our leading artist. Very good. Now, those are the sort of exercises that I like to see for. Learn from the past so that we won't replicate it. Mm. Don't be, not breeding hatred, breed understanding and say never again, never again can such a thing be allowed to happen and eliminate uh, evil uh, side effects or even mm. uh, effects like learned helplessness. Yeah. We have we, we have lost our sovereignty but we still have a country and we should be proud of it. Very good. Tim Pat Coogan, author of The Famine Plot, England's role in Ireland's greatest tragedy. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You don't have to go through that now like a man going through a current